Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Elizabeth Bosher, and I'm from Schuler Books. I'm the event coordinator there. I want to thank you all for joining us tonight virtually as we um, enjoy an evening with Christopher Preston in celebration of his book, Tenacious Beasts. Schuler Books is an independent bookstore with three locations in Michigan, and we are proudly celebrating 40 years of book selling this year. We can, you can follow along with all the bookstore happenings on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. Christopher Preston's essays have appeared in The Atlantic, Smithsonian, and Aeon, and on the BBC website. He is the author of The Synthetic Age by MIT Press, as well as Tenacious Beasts, and he teaches environmental philosophy at the University of Montana. Tenacious Beasts is an inspiring look at wildlife species that are defying the odds and teaching important lessons about how to share a planet. If you still need a copy of the book and wish to support this independent bookstore, please reference the link in the chat and you will be directed to our website, trulerbooks.com. If you are a Michigan local, we encourage you to check out our brick and mortar locations in Grand Rapids, Okemos, and Ann Arbor. We are about to begin here and I'm going to turn over the mic to Christopher, but keep in mind that we will have a question and answer session at the end and you can drop your questions in the Q&A bubble at the bottom of the screen or in the chat, but I will probably see them more likely in the Q&A bubble than in the chat. Um, so just be aware of that and we will get to them at the end as many as we can. And this goes without saying, but please remember to be respectful and mindful with your questions. Now, without further ado, welcome, Christopher. So, thank you so much. Let me share my screen. Can everybody see the slide now? Um, appreciate you coming out. Uh, appreciate you wanting to learn a bit about this book. My goal is to give you a lightning tour of some of the topics in about 20, 25 minutes, and then we'll open up for questions. Um, so, you know, how to begin? This took me three years to, to write this book and research it. Um, I think let's begin somewhere where we're all on the same page. So I'm gonna start with what we all know, which is this, we're in a biodiversity crisis. There are a million species threatened with extinction. And for those not threatened with extinction, the number of animals in each species is going down. One estimate says they've gone down 69% in the last 50 years. Climate change is going to worsen the challenge that wildlife faces. And so when Elizabeth Colbert says we're in the middle of the sixth extinction, she's not kidding. We really are. But I'm happy to tell you that that bad news story is not the whole story. Let me read the first paragraph of the book. Standing on the dock in the dead of Arctic winter, Schrenandus closed his eyes to the northern lights above. All the professor wanted to do right now was listen. As the mountains and green aurora faded from his retina, the sound of a gently rippling ocean washed over his body. Seconds after his mind quieted, he heard a splash of a large object followed by a fierce exhalation of air. Then he heard another. Then another. A fishy scent wafted shoreward. Casting his head back to the sky, Shrenanus' mouth cracked open as he drank in the frigid nighttime air. He was perched on the doorstep of whales. Dozens and dozens of whales. Humpback and killer whales drawn to Norway's cow fjord in the winter months to feast on herring. So this is a fjord in northern Norway. It's, it's way up there where Norway kind of bends around and heads towards Russia. And these humpback whales were filling this fjord. Um, it's not an exact, well, it is an exaggeration to say you could walk across the fjord on the backs of the whales, but it's not that much of an exaggeration. There were hundreds of humpback whales in this fjord. Another friend of mine up there, Trina Antonsen, she said, when the whales are in, you've got to close your windows at night or you won't get to sleep. There are so many of these whales breathing and feeding in these Norwegian fjords. They're feeding on herring and the herring have always come into those fjords, but there haven't been whales for a century. 
that whale population has recovered from about a thousand, and this is the North Atlantic humpback whale population, from about a thousand to about 35,000 animals in the last four decades. That's the North Atlantic humpback whale population, the North Pacific humpback whale population. So I'm in Montana, so I'm not quite on the Pacific, but I did some of my research on the Pacific. The North Pacific population has increased from about 1,200 humpback whales to about 26,000 today. So this is a staggering recovery of animals. And these humpback whales are good examples of what I call tenacious beasts. So let me do a definition here. You're a tenacious beast if you go close to the brink of extinction. Your numbers are severely depleted in the 90 plus percentage points. And then somehow something happens, a change in law or a little bit of luck, and you start coming back. So you hang on and then you start coming back. That's what makes you a tenacious beast. So my goal in this book was to find these tenacious beasts. Now, in the middle of a biodiversity crisis, that's kind of a challenge because most species are not doing so well. But if you keep your eyes open, you see quite a lot of these animals recovering. And I wanted to dig into those stories and see what we could learn. So I went on to farmland where I discovered wolves and wild boar and deer returning. I went on to prairie where I found bison and pronghorn antelope and also swift fox returning onto these prairie lands. I went to a number of different rivers and found beavers recovering. And I, I found salmon doing what they could to be tenacious beasts. I went into forests in Europe and North America and discovered a brown bear in Italy called the Marsican bear. And the Marsican bear is beginning to recover. It's been hanging on for a century at very low population numbers, but it's beginning to recover. I encountered owls hanging on and trying to come back in the Pacific Northwest. And then I went into ocean environments where I found these humpback whales that I've already mentioned, and also sea otters recovering strong. Now, when you write about recovering wildlife in the midst of a biodiversity crisis, you run the risk of sounding like you're completely delusional. And I wanna be clear that I am not delusional. <laughs> the animals that I uh, paint in this story uh, are just a fraction of the wildlife species. Uh, and many of them are still under stress. And so wildlife recovery is not common, but I'm shining a light on the species that are recovering for several reasons. I think there's some good reasons to do it. One, hope. Hope, hope is what inspires people. Hope is what moves people. If you can have a vision of a possible future, if you can feel what that will be like, if you can kind of sense it and smell it, then you're more likely to work hard for it. So I think it's important to show a bit of hope in the midst of very challenging times for wildlife. Something else I kind of learned as I wrote the book, recovering is what animals want to do. Biology seeks life. Animals want to live. And if you remember back to those first COVID days when we were locked up inside and you know air traffic declined, vehicle traffic declined, the amount of people outside shrank massively. What happened? Animals started coming back. Around the world, we started seeing these videos of species in different locations coming into city centers. There were um, cougars in Santiago, Chile. There were wild boar in Haifa in Israel. There were goats in Welsh villages. There were brown bears in medieval Italian towns. There were dolphins in the Bosphorus and in Venetian canals. What that illustrated, I think, is that wildlife is out there and it wants to survive. I mean, this is biologically true. If we take our foot off the gas, if we open up a little bit of space, we might be surprised at what animals can do. And so that's another reason I thought it important to shine a light on some of these successes. 
And then there's one more thing that I think is important. When a lot of these animals became depleted, a certain mindset about who they were and what they did came to dominate. And while the animals were gone, there was no chance to correct that mindset. So think of species like wolves or perhaps plains bison, suffered big declines down to low points, kind of around the, the turn of the 20th century or so, or a little later on than that in some cases. We're left with that vision of the animal. But look, when it comes back, we get another chance. We get a chance to look at it afresh. We've got better science. We've got better tools for coping with animals. We've got better ways of tracking them. We understand their behaviors better. And perhaps most importantly, there's a big public now advocating for animals. There's plenty of environmental groups and people committed to the recovery of wildlife. So when these animals come back, they're giving us a chance to think about them afresh. And that's part of what I wanted to do in this book, was to give ourselves a chance to think about some of these species afresh. So I'm just going to now kind of scoot through a few of the places I went to just to kind of give you a taste of some of these species. And uh, maybe this is kind of fodder for questions later on. I'll just mention some of what I spent time investigating. So here I am on the northern end of the Olympic Peninsula at the mouth of the Elwha River. And the Elwha River was interesting to my story because two dams were removed a decade ago in order to facilitate the recovery of salmon. So there's 75 miles of spawning habitat that was opened up by the removal of these two Elwha dams. And the salmon are starting to bounce back dramatically. It's taken a little while because when those dams came out, an enormous wash of sediment went down the river. And in fact, that beach that we're looking at in this photo did not exist before the dams came out. That beach reappeared because it was built by the sediments that had stacked up behind the dams. As those sediments cleared, the habitat for anadromous fish, so that means a fish that spawns in a river but lives most of its life in the ocean, that habitat opened up. And there's five Pacific salmon species that use that river. There's two trout species, there's lamprey eels. This is just like a massive bonanza of habitat that's opened up for these species. So I was on that beach with a lower Elwha Clallam tribe member, Robert Ellison, who was just giddy with excitement about what was happening here. The Elwha used to carry these huge Chinooks that Robert told me people would hold over their shoulder. And they were so long that their tails would drag on the ground. So we're talking about fish five or six feet long. And as those fish start to come back, the whole ecosystem is benefiting. Killer whales now patrol the mouth of the Elwha River because there are salmon coming back there and that gives the killer whales something to feed on. And perhaps less dramatic, but equally valuable for the tribe, this new beach has opened up a bunch of clamming possibilities that Elson's grandmother used to engage in. And in those opportunities had not been available for the best part of a century since those dams were in there. So lots of recovery, lots of excitement, lots of possibility. And this is a work in progress. We can watch the Elwha recover over the next decades. Hopefully, the fisheries biologist told me, hopefully the Elwha can get back up to 400,000 salmon a year returning to that river if everything goes right. Here I'm in Italy, and I'm with some folks who are pruning trees. And the reason they're pruning these trees is just extraordinary. It took, my, took me a while to wrap my head around it. They're pruning fruit trees to help apples reappear on the, in these abandoned orchards. So these orchards have been abandoned for about 50 years or so. They basically stopped producing fruit. And these volunteers are pruning these fruit trees to give the marsican bear something to eat. Now, the marsican bear has been crawling along at a population of 50 individuals for the best part of a century. But intensive efforts by people to create more food sources, 
to make the villages safer, to make traffic aware that these bears are recovering. Intensive efforts over the last 15 or so years has led to these bears beginning to come back. So the expert there is a man named Mario Cipollone. And he told me a couple of weeks ago, he said, I said, Mario, how many bears can I say there are right now? And he said, well, there's gonna be a genetic count next year, but you can be confident saying there's 70. And I'm hoping when the genetic count happens, we'll find that there's more. So 70 is still not a lot of bears, right? But it's a 40% increase on 50. And they've been at 50 for the best part of a century. And so to go from 50 to 70 and maybe a little bit more is really exciting news. And these Marsican bears are quintessential tenacious beasts. They've hung on and looking for an opportunity to come back. And if we create the right conditions, they will. Now, here I am not too far from where I grew up. This is Southern England. And this is a European bison, Bison bonassus. So it's a relative of the plains bison. It stands a little taller than the plains bison because it's a woodland animal. And part of what it does is it grazes on trees. So it likes the lichens and it nibbles a few shoots and a few leaves. And it's being restored to forest environments like this one to recreate the ecological health of the forest. Now, these bison have not walked the forests of England for 30,000 years. 30,000 years. And it made me laugh. I, I walked this uh, forest with the bison ranger. There's two bison rangers have been hired. And they put out a job ad for a couple of bison rangers. And they said, no experience necessary. And I mean, that's kind of ridiculous. If the animal hasn't been there for 30,000 years, it's kind of unlikely anyone would have experience. Um, but what they got was applicants from all over the world. Uh, one of the folks they hired had previously been a ranger in South Africa. So it had been around big game like the Cape Buffalo and lions and, and um, elephants. Uh, the other ranger was a local guy who went to wildlife college nearby and was just fantastic at telling stories about the landscape. So bison back in England, it's just remarkable. I grew up in England where the biggest animal I would see would be a bunny rabbit or a fox or something like that. And now they're a bison. It's really a shocking change. And the, the point that they were eager to stress for me when I toured this area with them, and, and I actually got to see the first bison that was brought back was a female. And I got to kind of look in the eye of this female bison and just think of the enormity of it. The point they made to me was that, yeah, this is kind of an ecologically driven restoration. You know, we're looking to restore the forests, but we're also hoping to change the culture. We're hoping to change how people think about wildlife. So this will be the first time in many hundreds of years that English people have had the chance to encounter a large animal on their landscape, a 2,000 pound bison. And this is totally new. This is a massive cultural shift. But the ranger said that the children were incredibly excited about it. Here I'm up in Alaska, I'm not diving taking a photo of this sperm whale, but I was having a conversation about a fishery specialist who was telling me about the problem of depredation. Now, what is depredation? Depredation is when fishermen start losing the fish that they've caught to wildlife. Now, what's happening here is the sperm whales who are recovering in the Pacific have learned how to get fish off of the long lines that fishermen put down on the ocean floor for halibut and for black cod. And apparently what happens is when the fishermen start to winch those long lines back aboard, so you can imagine like a, a line from the bottom of the ocean up to the back of the fishing vessel, every six feet is a baited hook. And when the fishing's good, there's a big fish on that baited hook. And the sperm whales are watching and they're smart animals, right? So they're watching and they're going, hmm, this looks like easy food. And Lauren Wilde, who was the fishery specialist I spoke to, said, just imagine if you're a sperm whale, it's like a sushi belt coming up in front of you. And what the sperm whales have learned to do, which is just sort of an astonishing technique, is they, they hook their lower jaw under this line. 
and they rest it between their teeth. So this line moves between their teeth and every six or eight feet, they feel a fish going by and they just crimp their lips down and pluck that fish off of the line. The fishermen call it flossing. So these sperm whales are flossing on these long lines and getting these fish off of these lines. And I said, the fishermen must be driven crazy by this. And Lauren said, well, yes and no. They understand that sperm whales need to eat. And she told me about a fisherman who was watching two sperm whales floss off the back of his boat. And a third sperm whale lay down alongside his boat, just lay there stationary. So the fisherman got his deck brush and just kind of scratched the sperm whale behind the ears and the sperm whale kind of enjoyed it. Here, I'm in the Pacific Northwest and these are Northern spotted owls. And I wanna use these to read another passage from the book for you. Um, because what I had learned with these recovering species is there's a big variety of ways that you help them recover. In some cases, you do nothing and they recover. And that's what happened to the humpback whales and the sperm whales. We stopped killing them and they recovered. And so one good piece of wildlife recovery advice is stop killing the animal. That will help the animal come back. But other times you need to do a lot more than that. You need to intervene. And several of the species that I covered require quite dramatic interventions. And this is a northern spotted owl here. And a northern spotted owl is under pressure from barred owls. So let me just read you a section here where I'm in the forest with a wildlife tech who has been trying to do something about barred owls. They've been trying to suppress the barred owl population. And what we were doing is we were going out into the forest to see if there were any barred owls still left in this one section of forest. So we were playing barred owl calls off a speaker that she carried in her truck. And the idea was that a barred owl, if there was one still there, would come to that call to investigate. The forests around Clay Ellum didn't have the barred owl density of Oregon's coast range. We have to work harder for our owls, said Melissa Hunt with a dash of pride. After five stations without any sign, I wondered if today's rain meant we were gonna get skunked. Owls don't fly much when it's wet. They don't like how noisy their damp feathers are. At the sixth station, just when Hunt was getting to the crux of the story about her recent elk hunt, the recording on the speaker was suddenly interrupted by a more urgent call coming from somewhere to my left, barred out. Hunt switched on her powerful flashlight, flicked it around the nearby trees. We craned our necks upward. She stopped it on a snag right next to the road. There she is. I followed the beam to the tree and saw absolutely nothing. The gray wood of the 50 foot trunk came to an end with a couple of short stobs and what looked like a rounded husk of bark. Where? Right in the beam, plain as day. You can see the shine in her eyes. I still saw nothing. I always thought of my eyesight as decent and the longer I looked, the more embarrassed I started to feel. Then the husk leant to one side for a few seconds before moving back upright. I grabbed my binoculars and scanned them up the trunk of the tree until I reached the top. The husk had transformed into an owl, its chest feathers dappled with streaks of gray. Through the binoculars, I could see a pair of black eyes glistening in the light. Now that would be a near perfect shot, said Hunt. 20 meters or less, no branches blocking the way. So Melissa Hunt was one of the best in the business at shooting barred owls to suppress their population so that the Northern Spotted Owl could recover. And she sh told me she'd shot 350 barred owls. And I said, are you okay with me putting that in my book? And she said, yeah, I think it's ethically justified. We've thought through this problem and I think it's ethically justified. And I wrangled with that complicated ethical dilemma in the book. So this was a case of heavy intervention being needed for these animals to recover. So that gives you a sense of, of a few of the places I went, a few of the stories, but here's the sort of big philosophical message. Animal recovery is an opportunity, obviously for the animal. If the animal comes back, that's great, but they're also an opportunity for us. Animal recovery is an opportunity for us to think about animals differently, to learn how to cohabit, to invent new skills and invent new attitudes, new ways of thinking about the world that lets them and us flourish. And so, Encountering all these different species helped me think differently about animals. And salmon showed up quite a few times in this book for me. I have a, a thing for Alaska. When I first moved over from England, I started going to Prince William Sound. I just loved it. I couldn't believe it. 
And salmon are, for me, a, a really special type of tenacious beast. All that journeying they do from salt water to fresh is really incredible. And here is the Loxall River in the Bitterroot Mountains, probably about 50 miles from where I live in Missoula, Montana. And someone told me you can see salmon in this river. Now, these salmon are 600 miles from the ocean. They are 4,000 feet above sea level. When you see them, they haven't eaten for several months as they've made their way up the Columbia River, up the Snake, into the Clearwater, and then the Loxall. They've navigated four giant dams on the Columbia, four giant dams on the Snake. They've avoided fishermen, they've avoided predators, and they've come here to spawn and then to die. I didn't know you could still see them up there, but an old fisherman told me where to go. And I went up there and I saw these salmon milling around in this pool, waiting to spawn. And I recognized the wisdom in the genes and the strength in their muscles to make it back up there. So seeing those salmon was incredibly moving for me. But after I left those salmon, my mind went somewhere else. My mind went to the future. And I wanna end here with just reading one more passage, which is towards the end of the book, a kind of reflection on what the future might look like. There was one more thought I had as, a, as I left the salmon behind that evening. There will come a day when Earth's population will peak. It may be shortly after the middle of the century, it may be later. Up to that moment, Earth's biodiversity is grinding its way up a hill like an ancient roller coaster, slowing so much it looks like it may never make it to the top. Each loud clack is a doubt about what will be left behind. But when it does reach the crest, the long struggle against gravity will finally flip to become an accelerating free fall. Millions of bodies will slither, fly, and hop their way back onto soils and waters released from service to human needs. Seeds will float in and take hold. Rhizomes will reach outward from their strongholds. And life-giving spores will alight on surfaces previously covered by crops and cement. There will be a joyous free-for-all as uncountable numbers of fins, hooves, pores, and carapaces rush onto newly liberated spaces. As Earth has done repeatedly in the past, life will bounce back. Recovering wildlife are the reservoirs that will fill out the green and blue spaces that will recolor the map. The work we do now will be a bridge to a world we can only dream of. Trickles of possibility will become cascades of life as animals regain the room to flourish. Just as we did for thousands of years in the past, our species will start to remember an ancient wisdom born of entanglement with the lives of animals. We will find ourselves bending once again to the pull of biological forces that never fully went away. So I hope that gives you kind of a sense of things. And uh, I am gonna stop sharing my slides here and maybe take some questions or yeah. just have a chat, whatever you want. Thank you, Christopher. Um, that was a wonderful introduction. And I know that I am eager to dig into this a little bit more. Um, the first question that pops up for me is there was obviously a lot of research done for this book. How long did it take you to write this book? I think three years is a good estimate. Um, you know, I have a day job teaching at a university, and I realized that in that day job, I had encountered a few species here and there. You know, I, I do environmental humanities at the University of Montana. So I'd encountered bison in Montana, like the wolf debate obviously is pretty um, current in Montana. Um, Alaska has been a big part of my life. So I'd encountered some of these through my work over eight or 10 years or so. And then I said, you know, there's a story here. So to, to dig in and to dig up some more species that, uh, that took me probably three years of research, I would say. Awesome. Yeah. Um, that's a long time to work on a project for sure. Yeah. Um, but that makes sense that, that your current role kind of uh, led you into that path. Um, for our participants today, if you want to drop questions in the Q&A, I will happily um, feed those to Christopher. And also, if you hear my dog in the background, I have my own beast um, here, and I apologize for that. But um, 
I thought it was very um, engaging and creative how you structured your book around different species, like each chapter kind of digs into a different species, um, different animal group. Did you have a favorite animal group? Maybe it's the salmon that you just talked about, but did you have a favorite one to research and study? So many favorites. It's so, I mean, these animals are so engaging. And, and also when you start meeting the people who are studying them and helping them recover, it's even more engaging, you know, because one of the, actually one of the lessons of this book was, you know, I thought it was about wildlife, but it was every bit as much about people. And as a philosopher, that made me sort of think about, huh, you know, we shouldn't really put wildlife over there and people over here. We should sort of think about the way people and wildlife are enmeshed. I have to say, I love the ocean chapter um, to go back up to Alaska. And, you know, I kind of hinted at it earlier on. Alaska for me is just this real kind of feeding ground for my mind and for my soul. You know, I had come from England where everything's very domesticated. Uh, the wildlife is, you know, feels fairly kind of repressed. And then going to Alaska and, you know, encountering killer whales and sea lions and seals and otters and bears is just an amazing place. So when I got to go to Alaska to research animal recoveries, and I went there specifically to do the humpback whales and to do the sea otters and to go out on the water and to see these animals and to meet the scientists studying them and to kind of witness the excitement of some of these populations coming back was it was just it was fantastic. You know, I, I, I was thinking, I remember when I got on the plane to go up to Alaska, I just thought I'm doing this for work. This is fantastic. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I love the ocean section. Yeah. Uh, work becomes a lot more fun when you're enjoying what you're doing, right? Yeah, it totally <laughs> does. It totally does. Yeah. I think, um, there are probably many answers to this question. Uh, but, um, what kinds of things surprised you in your research? Um, I think there's probably many answers because kind of the whole concept is a little surprising um, of how these animals are interacting with the world that we've created and kind of forced them out of and they're, they're coming back and forcing their way back in. But I'd be curious, like, what were some of the more surprising moments for you? Yeah, you know, it's a good question. I mean, you know, one surprise, like you say, is that, well, there are species coming back, you know, and you sort of think, really? Aren't we in a biodiversity crisis? And, you know, we are in a biodiversity crisis. Don't anybody go away from this thinking, oh, there's no crisis anymore, you know, that there is one. But it's obviously surprising to learn that there are species coming back. You know, river otters are in the San Francisco Bay area and they haven't been there for decades. Bobcats in New England are 10 times the population that they were a few decades ago because of forest recovery and uh, restrictions on trapping. Um, wolves are in every country in continental Europe. I mean, that's unbelievable. Continental Europe has half the land area of the United States, twice the people, and twice the wolves. So it's just incredible that, that these animals are, are coming back. So that, that's one sort of amazing thing. But then another amazing thing, this is like a different kind of amazing, is how an animal can be transformed in our mind. So, you know, a beaver was good for making into a felt hat and annoying because it floods out your land, okay? Now, you know, we're not into wearing beaver um, felt in our hats. Uh, and now a beaver is a teacher on how to restore a river. And I went up onto a creek not too far from where I am here to watch a PhD student studying how beaver dams alter the hydrology in uh, degraded creeks and meadows. And you know what was sort of mind bending about this was he was essentially apprenticing himself to the beaver. The yeah. beaver is the expert, the beaver knows how to do this. Yeah. And I wanna learn something from the expert. And I, I just sort of think about what a change in mindset that is, you know, from looking at an animal as a source of, they, they were called hairy banknotes, beavers, you know, because their fur was just kind of money. You know, that's, what, that's what it was. Um, so they, to go from being hairy banknotes to teachers and experts is such a dramatic transformation. Um, and of course, you know, it calls to mind the way that a lot of tribal people have thought about animals in the past as teachers. Yeah. Um, 
So I think that was, that's at a different level of surprise, but it's a level of sort of a surprise of ideas. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I love that. The, just the example of the beaver and learning from. Um, all right. We have a question from the audience. Uh, Janet asked, what is holding back a faster progress on animal recovery? Is it public support, money, governmental support, or something else? Yeah, I mean, it's it varies by every species, you know. Uh, and that was one of the things that I realized in this book, much to my chagrin, because, you know, philosophy, I'm a philosopher. Philosophers like to have clear principles, you know. Yeah. What's the one thing that helps? Um, but it, it's different in, in every case. Um, I mean, what's true in every wildlife case is good habitat. You know, like you have to have good habitat. Mm -hmm. um, and if you can create good habitat, you can, you might see some surprising things happen. And, you know, creating good habitat is complex, right? You know, it involves politics, it involves economics, it involves volunteers going and helping, you know, restore uh, areas and revegetate areas. Um, it's not an easy thing to do to create habitat, but wildlife need habitat. Um, and if we can sort of pull levers in our political discourse uh, and also pull levers in our communities to get people out there and create habitats. And these don't have to be, you know, Yellowstone size habitats. They can be micro habitats. Um, you know, people can do amazing things in their backyards by planting, uh, poly um, pl pl planting wildflowers for pollinators. Yeah. Um, there's sort of lots of things you can do sort of that range from you know tiny things in your backyard to national level things. And I'll, I'll just mention one international level thing. Um, two weekends ago, the United Nations agreed to protect 30% of the high seas from fishing. Oh, wow. Now, that is a staggeringly good move for ocean health. Yeah. If you've got 30% of the high seas where people are not gonna be going in and trawling and you know leaving lines in the water. Um, those are refuges, those are sanctuaries, those are incredible places for potential recovery on the high seas. Um, and so you know it took political will, it took many uh, years of negotiating. Um, but progress like that is just fantastic for um, wildlife in the ocean. And, uh, you know, we've all got to, like, keep pushing in, in the ways we can to make this happen in, in the environments that we all love. Yeah, yeah. Um, that kind of leads into my next question being, um, if I'm hoping that this book and topic kind of prompts us to maybe want to do a little bit more. Um, and if um, someone after reading your book says, I want to do a little bit more, um, maybe what's some simple ways that they can do that or what should they look for in their area as far as like organizations to get involved in or things like that? Yeah, it, you know, this, this is such a hard question to ask, right? Um, you know, some of what is needed, some of the things that are needed are big, you know, like doing agriculture a little bit differently, yeah. doing forest management differently, uh, you know, treating wetlands in a more considered way. So these, these are sort of big things. They're structural um, and they happen at um, you know, regional, national, and international levels. And so one thing someone can do is they can engage in those big structural things yeah. um, and try and make those changes happen at those big levels. But there's also a, an essential need for people to kind of wear their values on their sleeves. So, you know, if I'm interested in wildlife, you know, I need to go and help build a fence for a, a farmer, let's say, who's struggling with um, a, a, a recovering predator, for example. And in, in the book, there's, I tell a story about an organization in Germany called WikiWolves. And WikiWolves is coordinated um, by a woman named Natalie Soth. And Natalie got volunteers to go out on weekends and spend the day with farmers putting up electric fences. Mm. Um, and, you know, those volunteers are wearing their values on their sleeve. They're saying, I'm going to put my weekend into this. I'm going to make it happen. 
But in the process, what they're doing is they are interacting with someone who might not be so excited about wolves recovering. And so they are like building friendships mm -hmm. and like creating common values and recognizing common values in a way that wouldn't happen if they just sort of stayed home and written a check to an environmental organization. Yeah. So I think, you know, on the one hand, you've got these big structural national things. And on the other hand, you've got individuals getting out there on the land, having difficult conversations, mm -hmm. um, showing people what you care about and being empathetic to those people who might, you know, might be a little hesitant. Mm -hmm. um, I think that kind of work, that, that sort of cultural, social type of action, I think that's just incredibly important if these recoveries to spread. Yeah, 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 that's great. Um, okay, I know that authors are often readers. Um, and so one question that I like to throw out to our authors is what are you reading right now? Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm kind of a natural history freak. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I was at the Tucson Book Festival a couple of weekends ago and I listened to an author talk about um, a book he's just written about the recover the the, the short faced bear. So the short faced bear was the biggest bear on this continent. It doesn't exist anymore, um, but it was way taller than a grizzly, way bigger than a polar bear. Um, on its standing up on its hind feet, it would be sixteen feet tall. Wow! Um, <laughs> and it was badass. You know, this was just like an incredible animal. But it was short faced because its nose was kind of compressed into it. It's got this very distinctive skull. It doesn't have that sort of Roman nose of a black bear. <laughs> it's got this very kind of pug pug face um so i'm reading uh that book uh it's called something i think it's called the the ghost bear or uh mm -hmm. something along those lines yeah um i also picked up a book by erica geis uh and the title is something along the lines of uh water water always wins and it's about um the need to manage water differently yeah um so i yeah i i keep a list of the books i read and I keep imagining that there's going to be, you know, more fiction and science fiction in there. But when I look at the, when I look at the list at the end of the year, it's almost always um, natural history type stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I need to do better and broaden my uh, broaden my reading taste a little bit. That's okay. Everybody's reading journey is different, and yours feels pretty consistent. Um, and um, hopefully uh prompts more questions and things um on that note uh what is next for you are you working on another project are you doing additional research um are you just doing your day job um <laughs> no i I, yeah. I definitely like to add spice to my day job and you know this this type of writing i've been doing recently is just incredibly exciting to me i i, I love it i love going out there and meeting people learning about stuff that uh you know the world is an interesting place um you just have to kind of go and find the interesting facts um so i wrote before this book i wrote a book called the synthetic age which was about how technology is taking over the world mm -hmm. and this book is kind of like the diametric opposite of that yeah um you know on the one hand you've got people dominating a landscape and then on the other hand you've got animals recovering on a landscape and so this this book was kind of an antidote to the synthetic age. And it was kind of like therapy for me, you know, because I got so deep into technology. And, you know, I mentioned before we got on the webinar that I do biotechnology a little bit and I do de extinction uh, mm -hmm. a little bit and the ethics of de extinction and I do climate engineering. So these are all technologies, you know. Um, so this is this is sort of therapy like, okay, let's get away from technology and start doing wildlife spontaneity joy you know like this the the sort of incredible unpredictability of the living world um so that that's the sort of trajectory of the last five years and kind of looking forward i'm i haven't settled on on the topic of my next work but i am quite interested in carbon um i i sort of have this feeling that the next century there's going to be a lot of talk about carbon and what to do with it and where to put it. Um, and, you know, getting carbon out of the atmosphere and putting it somewhere safe kind of 
runs the gamut of uh, working with wildlife to help us on this. And one of the stories in, in this book, Tenacious Beast, that you know I can maybe just mention quickly here, is learning about whales and sea otters in Alaska um, brought me to realize that whales and sea otters both help us with the carbon problem. Um, sea otters do it by helping kelp forests grow. Mm -hmm. um, it's an interesting little set of connections. Sea otters eat sea urchins. Sea urchins damage kelp forests. So if you got sea otters recovered, you have less urchins and you have more kelp forests. Yeah. And the kelp forests pull carbon out yeah. of the system yeah. dramatically. Um, so sea otters help us with carbon. Whales help us with carbon too. And they do that by moving nutrients across the ocean. Mm -hmm. And, you know, whales migrate large distances. And when, so they get fat in their feeding grounds and then they migrate to their calving grounds. And in their calving grounds, essentially as they lose weight over three or four months, um, they're, that you're losing weight into the ocean, right? Because, you know, they're pooping and, and they're giving birth and they're lactating. So a lot of stuff's going into the ocean. That is nutrients. And those nutrients feed the phytoplankton and the phytoplankton suck carbon out of the atmosphere. And so this uh, topic of how animals can help with the carbon problem mm. is completely fascinating. It, it has the, um, it's got a very fancy name and I'm only going to mention this name just to sort of make people realize how academics are so addicted to long words. <laughs> the name is zoo geochemistry. <laughs> Zoo geochemistry is like how animals interact with uh, chemical cycles, in this case, the carbon cycle. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in carbon. I'm interested in the role of wildlife in sequestering carbon, and then also the role of technology in sequestering mm -hmm. carbon, because there's things we can do, things our engineering cells can do to pull carbon out of the atmosphere too. And so I'm sort of imagining there's a bit of a story to tell here about the people who are wanting to encourage wildlife recoveries for carbon reasons mm -hmm. and the people who want to develop technologies to address carbon. I think there's going to be a sort of synergy here and it's something I'm interested in exploring. I bet there are some fascinating people uh, working in these areas that I like to chase down. Yeah, yeah, that sounds fascinating. Um, I'm excited for you to dive into that. Um, all right, I have another question from our audience here. So Amanda asks, well, she says, hi, Mr. Preston. <laughs> I'm Hello. a uni student working toward a degree in marine science. How might someone like me get on the path to seeing and getting involved in some of these rewilding projects around the world and meeting the kind of people you've met firsthand? And what would you say is the best thing for aspiring conservationists to keep in mind when bringing the gap between people and bridging the gap between people and wildlife? Yeah, good, you know, good question. Um, so it, it's all, you know, I, I sort of went through the process of sort of student to teacher to writer. And um, I know you've probably heard this a thousand times, but networks are just so important. If you hear somebody doing interesting work, email them. Um, if you know somebody in the field, ask them who they know and start creating a network. Start creating a network of people who will know your name and will know you're interested in something. You know, you might end up having to volunteer for a summer or for two summers um, on a project just to kind of get to know people and get to know the landscape and get to gain experience. Um, but there's really, there's no alternative to uh, networking and, and sort of getting connected to people who do this work. And you know what I found, like I, I had to call dozens of people who didn't know who I was at all um, and, and say, hey, uh, I'm interested in what you do. Can I spend some time with you maybe? Would you be willing to show me what you know? Um, and uh, they are without exception, incredibly generous with their time. Um, they love what they do and they want other people to love what they do. And so you get the opportunity to hang with people and learn from them and slowly kind of build up experience. 
Um, and so that was the first part of your question about how to get involved. And the second part of your question I had in my mind for okay. half of my speech there, and then I lost it. That's okay. Um, and what would you say is the best thing for aspiring conservationists to keep in mind when bridging the gap between people and wildlife? Yeah, so empathy. Mm -hmm. I would say empathy. It, it's very easy. Like if you're very pro-wildlife on something, it's very easy to say, well, why doesn't everybody else want these wildlife? You know, why is this so complicated? And it's very easy to be dismissive mm -hmm. of somebody who might be on the other side. But there's a good chance that somebody on the other side shares a lot of your values. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there's an interesting issue in Montana here about, you know, ranchers and bison and ranchers and wolves. Um, and the worst thing is to see these battle lines kind of harden. Um, understanding where someone is coming from is just critical and, and being empathetic and understanding why, you know, life, like if you're a rancher or a farmer, life is more precarious. So of course you're gonna be worried about a wolf. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, so there's kind of a flip side to that too. If you're a farmer or a rancher, you realize that somebody who lives in the city, you know, doesn't get to see a lot of wildlife. So of course they're gonna want a wolf or a bison on the landscape. And so, you know, there's a need for empathy on both sides here. Uh, and, you know, empathy is best displayed in person. So, you know, if there's opportunities to help someone on a project, uh, you know, I mentioned WikiWolves in Germany, um, but those were opportunities to kind of literally go out there and interact with someone, who, you know, with whom you might have a, a, a values conflict initially, you might sort of think, well, I'm really for this animal and you seem to be against it. Um, but interacting with that person, recognizing the shared values. And, you know, let me, let me say, there's not many people who don't love the idea of a healthy environment with wildlife on it. Um, that, this is a very popular view to have. Um, and so if you can sort of identify those shared values and then work out ways to reduce conflicts, um, I think that can kind of go a long way. And, and, and especially recognize when the conflicts are economic, you know, recognize when somebody has a livelihood on the line or money on the line. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, those people who are very pro wildlife have to be willing to put skin in the game. And this sometimes means time and effort but it sometimes means money. Um, you have to be willing to pay for, you know, for example, predator-friendly beef. Um, you know, that's a thing. People raising their cattle or their sheep in ways that are friendly to predators. And it, it costs more to do that, but you have to be willing to pay for it uh, if you want to see those animals back. So, you know, that's a long answer and it's a complicated answer, but it, it's a complicated question. Yeah. You know, there's no kind of simple answer to it. Um, but yeah. Go, go into this work with, with a, a, a big heart and a positive spirit. And I think you'll be surprised at how much good can happen. Yeah, yeah. Curiosity, empathy, and openness to <laughs> just everything. All right, we are almost out of time here. Um, before we close out this session, I do wanna remind you that we would love it if you purchased a copy of Tenacious Beasts because I think there's a lot more to this rich conversation um, that you will discover within those pages. Um, I have dropped the link in the profile to our website if you'd like to order through us um, and we ship all over the country and internationally. So um, would love for you to check that out. And Christopher, before I let you go, where can people find you online that they can maybe follow along with your continued work? Sure, I have a, a website, ChristopherJPreston.com. Uh, it's just the name that's on the book, ChristopherJPreston.com. And I, I have a blog, which I update every couple of weeks, um, a list of events, um, a list of some of my other writings. And if you forget that name, I'm at the University of Montana in the philosophy department. So if you look at University of Montana philosophy faculty, you'll find me there too. So that's two ways you can get in touch. Awesome. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining me tonight. This conversation was a delight. <laughs> Thanks so much. This was really fun. Appreciate it. Yeah. All right. Have a good night, everyone. And thank you for being here.